That's the first time we've ever done that. Turn and face the other way. My wife got to see that there's other people back here, sometimes sitting down front. Some of you get out before she gets to see who is here. I've also uh, jokingly said with Jamie and I have talked about that some Sunday I'm going to surprise everybody and I'm going to come down from here, go to the back and preach to the back of the church and have you turn and face that way. So uh, anyway, today is a special day and I want to just add my two cents worth uh, of appreciation for all the moms that are here. And if you're here and you're not a mom, you certainly had a mother and hopefully you have an appreciation for that. But I also am keenly aware that there are some situations in life where it's not always been a mother, but maybe it's a grandmother or an aunt or a special woman who helped to nurture a, you, you as a young person, perhaps. And I just want to say that we have great admiration and thanks for those godly women who provide such good examples not just when the children are little, but all throughout their lifetime as they grow up, also as they serve in our churches. I would like to just share a few things. This is not a, in the past I've done a whole Mother's Day message, and as you know, I'm starting into a new series. I hear the horse is coming, a rather apocalyptic sounding theme, and it is going to be that, but that's not the entire message today. But I do want to start off with just a few other comments since it's Mother's Day. I'm taking this from an article by Christine Knight. She has a newsletter that's called Mommy Nearest. She asked mothers to consider how many superpowers do you actually have? Have you ever considered how much you know about healing and how to bring a fever down or how to clean a cut, how to treat burns? Or do you have the superpower of intuition, knowing when your kids are up to no good Maybe it's just a little too quiet out there. Or super hearing, alert to the silence of the mischief, discerning that this child cry in a room. Maybe you have the super hearing that can discern a child from an entire room of children and recognize your own. Perhaps you have had superhuman strength carrying a, a belligerent child who doesn't want to follow you in one arm while carrying the groceries up two flights of stairs as you return from the grocery store. Perhaps you've had, and I think a lot of moms have this one, the dishonesty detector. They just seem to know when the child is just not being truthful, when they're up to no good. Or, and I think many women are so good at this, more than us men. You know, I have a dog, and the dog is only able to concentrate on one thing, and I think we men sometimes are more like that, one thing at a time. But women are multitaskers. They seem to have a super ability at times to do that. Or x-ray vision, perhaps, of knowing that the child is not really getting ready behind that closed bedroom door to go to school in the morning. And then finally, the author brings to mind this question. How is it that a mom who in high school or when she was younger was not the most athletic of persons, maybe not the most coordinated herself, but once she becomes a mom, she develops a superhuman ability to shoot a limb out, maybe an arm or a foot or a leg, to break the fall of a child off the changing table or as they topple out of a crib or off of a park bench or off of the playground equipment. It's interesting to see children, in, in my experience, all the young women when they become mothers, and after a very short time, they have a deepening appreciation for their own mothers because they realize how hard they had it, how difficult it is to do all the things that the moms do. And today we remember and we honor our mothers, and we honor all the women for who they are. What a gift to mankind. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And God gave us women. If you think the world's a mess today, I cannot even imagine what it would have been like to not have women to put some constraints on those boneheaded decisions that we men make sometimes, especially when we were young and growing up. I do thank God for moms. I'm going to see mine for lunch today. She's 93, and we're blessed to have her. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I just want to pause for a moment and just... 
praise your holy name. I want to praise you because of all that you do for us, all your wisdom. I thank you, Father, for the wisdom in giving mothers all the abilities that they have and that complements the men so well to make us whole, to make the family complete. Father, I pray a special blessing on every one of them here today, but I also pray for those who maybe are not moms, or maybe they think they're so far past being moms because they're grandmothers and great-grandmothers. I pray, Father, you'd help them to just sense how appreciated they are, how crucial they are to the family of God. May you bless them today. And Father, I pray as we go into this message today that people will be encouraged and not discouraged by thinking about where we are, where we are on your timetable, because we know that someday soon we're going to hear the come up hither. And Lord, if we are born again believers, we look forward to that as our blessed hope. Now we just dedicate everything else that takes place in this service to you, to your honor, and to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I said last week, I introduced that I was going to be doing a series called I Hear the Horses Coming, and I'm speaking on this topic at this time because I just sense such an urgency, such an urgency that we are seeing fulfilled before us, steps that are putting into place fulfillment of biblical prophecy of the current world events. I suspect many of you also are aware and sense those same things. As we go forward in the next few weeks, I'll be exposing some very specific things, some very disturbing developments, but I want to remind all of you that are born-again Christians that we do have that blessed hope. The blessed hope for the believer is that day of the ingathering of the church of believers. I am a person who is firmly entrenched, and I know all the theories, but I am a pre-tribulation rapture pastor. I do not believe that God has set in motion these things or is going to allow his bride, the church, to go through the horrors of the tribulation period. But I do not know how much terrible things we're going to see before the tribulation starts because that's very non-specified in the scriptures. In the book of Revelation is where I'll be today. You know, the book, and I've said this before, many of you are aware of this, the book of Revelation is very special. It's the only book that has a special promise of blessing. And we find that in the first chapter of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3. And it says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, John wrote those words while he was on the Isle of Patmos almost 2,000 years ago. How much closer are we to that day of that blessed hope now than when he wrote those words? And where is the blessing? The blessing comes in reading the word of the prophecy, hearing it, and taking it to heart. Taking it to heart means to understand it, to begin to believe in it, and to realize what it's all about. There are some churches that tell you not to read this book, not to study this book because it's confusing. We had an exchange student years ago. Her father was in a European country and he was a pastor. And their denomination told them they should not read this book. She had never heard anyone speak about the book of Revelation until she moved in with our family. Six months of living in our family, she heard it. In fact, she was in our high school youth group at the church we were attending, and I taught. I had been asked, the youth came and asked if I would teach the book of Revelation to them. That was a real joy. So she heard things she had never heard before. What a blessing it is when we look forward to the Lord's return. The rapture of the church. It's us, believers, going from earth to meet him in the clouds, as it said that he did. The second coming is when Christ comes from heaven to the earth. We're already with him when he comes back because we've been in heaven for those seven years. We have been at the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ, and we have been judged for our acts, our deeds, and we have our rewards, and we are dressed in linens, clean and white. We find that in Revelation chapter 19. It says those linens represent the righteous acts of the saints. That tells you that you've been to the bema seat because now you are dressed only in righteousness. 
We are the bride of Christ. And we are going to go just the way that Jesus ascended when he left this earth at the ascension. The church is going to be with Jesus in heaven. Yes, during those events of Revelation chapter 4 and onward, you don't see the church anymore in the book of Revelation during that seven-year tribulation period. That beginning of the seven-year tribulation period is the end of the church age. The church age, some, well, they... There's a little disagreement. Some say it's when Christ came and was born in the manger. Some say it began at Pentecost. But in that time frame, that's when the church age began because the Jews rejected him. And the Jews are still living as a, in general anyway, in ignorance of who Jesus Christ is. And that's what the seven-year tribulation period is all about. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble because Jacob was renamed Israel, wasn't he? And so that seven-year period of time is all about bringing Israel to salvation. And God is so wonderful that it says all Israel will be saved. During that tribulation time, there's going to be a revival like has never been seen on the earth. And that revival is going to come during the most treacherous and dangerous and most awful time on the earth. I believe there will be some Gentile believers Maybe some of our relatives, some unbelievers and neighbors who don't believe that Christ is the Son of God or haven't put their faith and trust in Him, but they'll be here during that time. I believe some of them will also be saved. But that time of tribulation is going to be like a time that's never been upon the face of the earth. It's a time of Jacob's trouble, as I said, and he himself, Israel, will be saved out of it according to Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Seven-year tribulation. It's something that we talk about a lot. But we as the church do not need to be worried about because we're not going to be here. Revelation 3, verse 10, Jesus said, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth. He was speaking that to the church of Philadelphia, but I believe we can apply that to us as believers. As we look at and we see the current events that are lining up in accordance with the events predicted for a One world ruler is coming into place, isn't it? A cashless society and even the pounding of hoofbeats can be seen of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, even in the pandemics that we've had, even in the the economy that we see. And you think it's over? This morning they said that 40 states are seeing the pandemic coming back rapidly. They're beginning to think about reinstituting masks and restrictions. Bill Gates... He warned, the worst is yet ahead of us with the pandemic. Do you think Bill Gates might know something that we don't? Cashless society. Our president has just authorized our government to start setting up for a digital currency. All these things that we see every day when we look at the news. Last week I told you about the propaganda put out by Russia about how they could wipe out. Any of you see that this week later? How they could hit with missiles, they could hit England and Ireland and anywhere in Europe within 200 seconds. They're threatening nuclear annihilation. That's why I feel there's urgency to assure the people, also to caution people if they're on the fence and they haven't made themselves ready. The church needs to steady her nerves with expectation of that blessed hope. With Israel becoming a nation on May 14, 1948, that's like the granddaddy of all prophetic signs. The time clock started because it says that no, this generation that sees all these things happening, well, all those other things, the earthquakes, the storms, all the violence on the earth was happening and the wars and rumors of war, but the one thing was Israel was not in their nation until 1948. And said so the generation that sees these things will not pass. That's been 74 years ago. What do you think a generation is? How long do you think we have before Christ returns? And if Christ returns to the earth in all his glory at that time, we know seven years earlier is the rapture of the church. Are you ready? Scripture indicates clearly that the focus at the end is not going to center around the United States. It's going to be around Jerusalem, Israel, the Middle East, 
the Mediterranean region, Arab states that have, some of them have different names now, but those nations are even named in the scriptures and the prophecies, Israel and Russia. These are all key players, even the kings of the east with China. The United States is never mentioned. Now some say, and I've heard some people have CDs out and they'll talk about America in prophecy. Well, they have to look pretty hard because they'll talk about, and I believe we are prophetically there, of course, with all nations, or the young lions. Some believe that that's a reference to the nations that come off of England. But I want to tell you that if you think it centers around the United States, if you think it centers around the church, Christ church, then you are saying that you believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology is a bad teaching. That says that the church has replaced Israel, that God is done with Israel because they rejected Christ. And that when you read the scriptures and prophecies, you need to take anywhere it says Israel and re replace it with the church. Well, I want to tell you, I don't want to be, I don't want to be part of that that replaces Israel because I don't want to endure the time of tribulation. Scripture's clear, it's for Israel. Jacob's trouble. It's not the church's trouble. The church is the bride of Christ. America is not going to have a spot of preeminence. Something has to happen, and I've taught this in, as an adult Sunday school teacher 40 years ago, and I believe it to this day that something has yet to happen, is going to have to happen because the United States is the most powerful nation on earth. We are the leader in the world, aren't we? But something is going to happen to us that makes us not at that preeminent position. Now, I believe it's either going to be either an economic collapse or I believe it could be a first strike nuclear attack that debilitates us. That's what I used to say, and I think that's still possible. I also think it might be just from the fact the rapture itself happens. I don't believe there's a nation on earth any more Christian than we are, even though we look about and we call this a godless nation anymore, but there's still lots of believers. The United States has believers from coast to coast. And imagine the condition of this world when the rapture of the church happens and all the God-fearing people are taken up. Think what's left. So I hope that that's the cause, because then I know we're out of here before all that happens, but it could be a combination of the economy, maybe a war, maybe something that happens. But I hope it's because of the rapture. But I think it's probably more likely some of the other things. We hear the term, the Great Reset, and I've mentioned this in recent months. You hear it all the time. Every report says that they are out to change everything that affects everyone in the world. Everything from our economy, our religion, our education, our energy, our governments, you name it. They had like, I think I told you before, was it 64 different categories? They're going to control everything. And then Klaus von Schwab says, you'll own nothing by 2030. In eight years, they're predicting you'll own nothing and you will be happy about it. That's what the World Economic Forum is saying. That's what the world movers and shakers, something is in the offing. They're being so bold to give us hints to tell us that something's up. And they're saying, you're going to be glad. Well, if you're going to be glad about owning nothing, something terrible is going to happen in the meantime, I would say. They have plans for you. Let me tell you, the World Economic Forum has you, your property, your riches in mind. To accomplish the Great Reset, first you have to destroy what already exists. If we're listening, we can hear the hoofbeats of the horses of the apocalypse coming. I'm not going to preach on that till next week. We'll get to the horses next week. But today, today I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 5 if you want to follow along. One of the most glorious and most wonderful chapters, chapters 4 and 5. I could just stay in there. I love to think. You want to think something positive today, you stay in those two chapters. Don't look ahead. Revelation chapter 5, starting verse 1. And John is writing this. He says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, 
Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and I wept because no one was found who is worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. My message today is called The One Who Is Worthy. The One Who Is Worthy. The scene here in chapter 5 is in God's throne room, and God is on the throne. And in his right hand is something very significant. All attention is drawn to it. He has in the right hand of God, he has this scroll with seven seals. But there's a problem. No one is able to open the seal. And John innately or somehow it's revealed to him that this is of extreme importance. He needs to know. God wants him to know what this scroll contains, but no one can open it until they consider the lamb. The lamb that looked as if it's been slain. Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, without a doubt, it's Him, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Chapters 4 and 5 gives us the greatest view of the inside of God's throne room that you can find in the Bible. A few weeks back when I was preaching on Job, I talked about some of the courts of heaven and how Satan came before the throne of God to accuse Job. He comes there to accuse the saints, we know also from the book of Revelation, He still has access. He's been cast down, but he still has access. He isn't totally eliminated from access until late in the book of Revelation. But here is the throne room of God. It's a place where God is seated on the throne in chapter 4. It describes a throne surrounded by light, a crystal sea that goes out from before the throne. There are wonderful, amazing creatures that are there, and there's 24 other thrones that are surrounding God's throne and seated upon her, the 24 elders. That's a fabulous scene. Reading on in verse 6 of chapter 5, John writes, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, no other than Jesus Christ. There is no doubt. He is seen standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and by those 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fall down before the lamb. They fall down in worship. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, I want to tell you, that's a verse I've shared with this group before. I love that verse. I love to read about the bowls of incense that are full of the prayers of the saints. I imagine that those prayers are prayers of praise and glorifying God. Those are the prayers when he remembers when you first cried out to him, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and forgive me. I believe they are also the unanswered prayers of the saints that you think have not been answered or never going to be answered, but they're still brought in remembrance before your Lord and your God. That's such a beautiful scene. When Jesus takes the scroll, just imagine what we're being described to us here. There is such a flurry of activity when he receives the scroll from the hand of God. As they begin to fall down prostrate before him, singing and worshiping him, Singing praise, there's a real worship session that just broke out. And then we read, what must be almost all the angels of heaven show up simultaneously because we read in verse 9, and they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircle the throne and the living creature and the elders in a loud voice they sing. 
I mean, there is just an eruption of activity in the throne room of God and the angels, they just surround the place and they are just singing. What a scene we cannot even imagine. This is just the most wonderful thing to consider. What's it say about those whose blood has been purchased? He is the one who purchases the blood. But those who have had their blood purchased, those who are born again, we have been made priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. God has saved you to reign. God has not saved you to grovel. God has saved you to lift you up. He has saved you because he has better plans for you. And when you come back with him at the end of the book of Revelation, when he makes his second appearance, the armies of heaven, including the church, his bride, are with him. We're coming back to reign with him during that thousand year. I'm kind of giving you an overview at times today. But it's wonderful, isn't it? As we read those verses 11 and 12, and we think about those angels that have just shown up and singing encircling the throne and they're singing worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That's heavenly angels saying that about God's son. That little babe in a manger that we celebrate at Christmas. The one who was born in a manger who was raised by a carpenter who ministered healing and grace to those he encountered during his life on this earth. And he gave forgiveness to them. The one who came meek and mild riding on the donkey to the agony and the humiliation of the cross. Now he's seen how he truly is. And I will tell you this, it's how he was. This scene that we're seeing described here today isn't just how it's going to be or how it is today. It's how it was before Christ came to earth in the manger. He left his heavenly home in glory to come and to be one of us. Isn't that incredible? He was here in that type of a setting and he came to earth. That was before electricity and before plumbing, if I have my history right. A pretty low estate for the king of kings, lord of lords. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8 speaking of Jesus Christ, says, who being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Just describing what I'm telling you there, he was there. He was in glory from everlasting and he gave it up for you and I to come and abide in the flesh and to be our Lord and Savior, our sacrifice, the Lamb who was slain. Yes, only Jesus is worthy to open this scroll. The scroll is likened to the deed to a property. When you purchase a house or a piece of land, you get a deed showing ownership. God had the deed to the earth in his hand, and the only one worthy to take that deed is the Son. He has ownership. The earth belongs to the Lord, doesn't it? Psalm 24, 1 says as much, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. As we move forward in this series into chapter 6, we're going to be watching along with John as Jesus opens each of these seven scrolls, or seven seals on the scrolls on the scroll. I'll get it right. The seven seals on one scroll. But I want you to understand those seven seals only make up about one-fourth of the time span of the tribulation period. They're only the first seven things that are opened, that are revealed. We'll begin to look at some of those next week. We'll be looking at some of the horsemen of the apocalypse, but we're also going to look at some of the events that are introduced by the seals. If you think that the first half, or if you've been taught that the first half of the tribulation period is going to be good, going to be easy, I want to tell you it's not. You'll see that beginning next week. The first three and a half years are also going to be bad. 
the events that are introduced there are not going to be pleasant. They're going to be difficult. It's going to be marked by war and famine and death. Nations are going to fall as dominoes with their sovereignty. They're going to put their leadership in one man, the one world leader. But he doesn't really come into power till the midpoint. But he's behind the scenes working. I'll explain that next week with the first horseman. It appears, and we talk about him coming with peace in order to rise to world dominance, but yet there's tremendous upheaval because governments do not give up power easily. In order for there to be an Antichrist-led world, the governments that we have today must fall. They can either fall by being overtaken by power or they have to give up and yield their power to another. So I'm telling you what we're seeing today on your news every day anymore is the steps of governments giving up their authority, their sovereignty. Why do you think the world hated, and I'm going to say it, hated Donald Trump so much? It's because Donald Trump wanted to maintain the sovereignty of the United States. He was throwing a monkey wrench into the worldwide body of governments all one. I know that many maybe didn't like Donald Trump, but I want to tell you that those who want to come to a one world power really hated him. In order for this one world government to come to power under the Antichrist, also currencies are going to have to fail. We have to have a one world currency. We are going to have, I believe, a one world digital currency, even as our own president is authorizing now for us to go digital. When you think about it, you can see how artificial intelligence, how all the scientific things that are being developed will be able to control everything. If you can control the money, if you can control the food, you control the world. Even what we're seeing with the supply chain and with China right now, they're bringing us to our knees. Next week, I'm going to talk more about that, too, because one of the horsemen of the apocalypse is famine. In order for the Antichrist to come on the scene and to lead the world, the world as we know it must totally be changed. Things will have to be destroyed and fail. The world is going to be traumatized terribly during those first three and a half years of the tribulation. It's not going to be easy. But compared to what comes on the earth during the second three and a half years will almost seem like a utopian existence because at the midpoint, it really gets horrible during the second half. Since today is Mother's Day, and I've chosen a rather apocalyptic theme, which I thought was probably poorly timed, I'm going to end my message today going back to the Mother's Day theme. I'll save some of those comments for next week. Because mothers are so special. They have been what shaped our nation. Yes, men shape the nation, but behind every good man, there's an even better woman. My wife liked that part. I'd like to share with you a true story. A true story about a mother's prayer. A mother's prayer that shaped the history of the United States. A mother's prayer that saved an American president. It comes from a book entitled A Hundred Bible Verses That Made America. It's written by Robert J. Morgan. The Bible verse comes from Psalm 86, verse 16. I'll share that in a moment. In 1831, the woman's name is Eliza Garfield. She gave birth to a son. His name was James Abram Garfield. He was born in Mentor, Ohio, Cuyahoga County, just east of Cleveland. At two years of age, when James was two years of age, his 33-year-old father died while trying to extinguish a fire that broke out on their farm. They lived in a log cabin, and this left Eliza to manage the poor little farm but she was determined to raise her children with prayer as her secret weapon. When James became 
A teenager, he left home to work on the Ohio-Pennsylvania Canal. That was dangerous work, and one night he fell overboard because of a tangled rope on the deck. He was working all by himself on the deck that night, and after dark, the rope got tangled somehow in his foot, and it pulled him overboard. James said he didn't know how to swim. He began thrashing about and drowning, swallowing vast amounts of water, trying to find that rope, but when he grabbed the rope, the rope was just loose, and as he's pulling it, it did nothing to help him save himself. Gulping more water, becoming more desperate and continuing to thrash about. Finally, he grabs onto the rope once more and now it's tight. And he is able to pull himself up on the boat and to save himself. As he recovered, sputtering out and throwing up water and murky filth that was there in the canal. He looked about to see what in the world happened. That that rope suddenly became tight and he saw that the rope had gotten stuck between a crack between two boards and wedged tight that he was able to pull himself up. His employer sent him home to walk home that night because he was in no shape. He was sick from what he had taken in. By the time he got home, he was even feverish. But as he arrived home that night, there was a light still on in the log cabin. As he opened that front door, he found his mother on her knees. Her Bible was open, and it was open to Psalm 86.16. She later said she was doing her devotions and reading that passage of Scripture when suddenly she felt compelled to get to her knees, to get to her knees in prayer. And she prayed as she read the words to Psalm 86.16, which says this, O oh, turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. God's providence. God moved the mother to her knees to pray for the son. The son was not yet saved. He was a teenager, but shortly thereafter, a revival happened nearby, and he went to that, and he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. After he gave his heart to the Lord, he started preaching the gospel himself. He led at one revival, he led 36 people, I think, to the Lord. At some time thereafter, he became a lawyer. Later, he became a lieutenant general in the Union Army during the Civil War. Then he became the president of Hiram College. He also became a state senator. And then in the year 1880, he became the 20th president of the United States. James Garfield. His aged mother, Eliza, she traveled with him to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. She was the first mother of a president to see her son sworn into office. She was also the first mother of a president to live in the White House. She moved in with him. And today, if you visit the bedroom that she occupied in the Garfield home in Mentor, Ohio, east of Cleveland, you can see on the wall an old framed embroidery bearing the words, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Those are the most wonderful words I can end with this morning to encourage you to do. And I want to tell you, most of you have had mothers that prayed for you. If you didn't, you had a grandmother or some dear woman that was praying for you. Watch and pray. As we hear the hoofbeats coming, I want to tell you the church is called to watch and pray. We need to be a praying people. We need to pray more diligently, more fervently, more specifically for the needs of the church, of the nation, of our leaders. But I want to pray for revival. I want to pray that people that used to go to church that no longer darken the doors or have any desire that something might begin to stir in them. And if it takes the crisis of losing their wealth, their economy, if it takes losing the sovereignty of their nation, if it takes whatever kind of persecution comes ahead, then I say so be it if it brings people back to repentance. Because people need to get right because Christ is coming. That day is soon upon us. I don't know when it's coming. No one does. But perhaps today. Let's be a people that watch and pray. And thank your mother if you still are blessed enough to have her for all the time she prayed for you. 
I truly don't think I would be here if my mother and my grandmother hadn't prayed for me. God bless the moms. We're going to have you stand and turn around. <laughs> We're going to sing a closing song.